to another series of Quiver Financials Business Education, where we educate you, the business owner, on strategies that you should be implementing into your practice to help grow and protect your business. Today, we've got a special guest. I'm joined here with Donna Stern. She's a CPA here in Costa Mesa. Uh, Donna, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your practice? Uh, thank you guys for having me. Uh, I'm a CPA, as you said, and for about 40 years now, it's been a long road. Um, uh, I handle uh, taxes and accounting for individuals, businesses, I specialize in estate and trust work, which not many accountants do. Um, I enjoy it a lot. Um, I'm trying to take my practice in a new uh, direction, doing uh, subscription-based services, which we'll talk about later, and uh, trying to help the person that's doing their own return uh, in case they don't have a connection with an accountant. Oh, that's great. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, what is the number one question that you get asked by business owners? Um, mostly it's, uh, I have this big idea and I will, and everyone tells me I need to have a certain entity, you know, rather than just being a sole proprietor starting out. Um, so that's the biggest question. Should I be an LLC, an S Corp, C Corp, sole proprietor? What are the differences? Um, and I, I don't encourage them to rush into anything. You have to prove your concept first. Then if that's going, uh, it's very easy to get into any one of the entities. And depending on your situation, I would have a different answer for each person. Yeah, great. It's kind of like the financial stuff. You know, everybody is different for their different needs and no, all that type of stuff. It's not a one size fits all. Right. And, and maybe that's a, another video, you know, for the business educators that we go on to the complexities of, of that type of thing too. Sure. But and it's not that much different other than little idiosyncrasies, but the overall people say, oh, okay, am I allowed to deduct certain business expenses if I'm a sole proprietor rather than a sub S? No, a tax deduction is a tax deduction. How you get taxed would be based on what, ent what entity you have. Right. So that's right. the big difference. Well, let's shift gears just a little bit and talk about some of the big changes that are coming to business owners in 2023. Because um, there's a lot of things coming down the pipe. We're not going to be able to cover everything in this video. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind going forward. And one of the bigger ones that we kind of talked about, Justin and I have already done a video on, is the tax credits that you receive for starting a 401k. If you watched that video, great. If you haven't yet, we'll post a link to it in the description box. Um, please check it out. But what we kind of want to talk with you today, Donna, a little bit more is how business owners are going to kind of implement this or how they're going to see it on their tax return, what documents are they going to have to fill out, you know, paperwork, forms, all that type of stuff. So that your side of these tax credits. Well, we use a we all use a tax software mm -hmm. and a lot of that is built in there. So if you go to a special section called credits, um, you basically fill it in and the tax credit will be based on the number of employees. So I'm sure there'll be a box that say how many employees, 10. And the software knows it's 250 a, 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 a per, a, an employee. And then it does its calculation. And then it notes the limitation of the $2,500 for uh, 10 people or uh, 5,000 if you had 25. Um, but an important point, which I think you've talked about before, is the cow savers that people don't understand. They're going to have to have some kind of plan for people. And each one has a different cost. There's the simple IRAs, um, there's the 401k to find benefit. So everyone's going to need to understand these credits uh, and whether you want to have a plan or not, or well, have a credit or not. And it's yeah, there. And that's you know, a great point. And we've said it before in other videos like Seven Cal Savers that it is now mandatory to offer a plan in the state of California and soon to be nationwide mandatory to offer a plan. So. It's advantageous to just do it now, get in, get the credits, and, and move forward. And that would be another good video to do, the kind of plans that are offered and the pros and cons of each. Mm -hmm. uh, simplicity over um, complexity, uh, protecting your assets. Some do, some don't. Right. Um, I've switched from a SEP IRA to a profit sharing plan for that purpose alone. Oh, great. Just to have the coverage. Okay. 
Um, okay, so we, you know, some good information there. I know we've touched a little bit on, you know, the Secure Act, some of these tax credits. She's given you some information on where to look for. It's in the software. Um, yeah, there's but, nothing for people to do. Right. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure some people, you know, when they go online, even if they're looking themselves, they're like, oh, well, what does this actually mean? Where would I find it? Who would, you know, do I need to tell my tax person? Because they may not be fully aware. Um, so one of, the, one of the other questions we're going to change gears here is um, the bonus depreciation is going away. Do you want to elaborate a little bit more on yeah, that? Yeah, that's been a nice perk, automatic, you know, bonus when, again, when in the software you enter the uh, asset, it's, that's the, it's automatic. You'd have to elect out of it if you didn't want to. And you wouldn't want to if you have losses, like why take the full depreciation in one year? if it's just gonna sit there in your loss carryover, which also has limitations. So um, bonus was very nice. And like you said, it's going away. So it was 100%. And then each year they're going to diminish it 80%. And then the balance, so you take 80% of the value of the asset and then the rest will be depreciated based on its life, five, seven years. Um, and then in 20, uh, 2025, 40%, 2026, 20%, and then 2027, it's gone. I live in today. I don't worry about the future because you'll get new presidents in, new tax law. They'll need new money. If the economy is failing, they're going, they could bring it back because that promotes uh, investment in assets. So um, this is what the law is now. Don't base your life on it. Sure. <laughs> Just know what 20 three and 24 will look like. So when you're making tax projections. Right. And what do you mean in 2027, it's, it's gone. So like you, that you've already depreciated the full, the asset at that point. No, meaning you buy a new asset and you have to utilize the, the basic, uh, depreciation schedule, which is makers, uh, makers, five year makers, seven year, um, or you can elect section 179 which was our bonus depreciation before, right. but it was an election. So when I was doing returns, if it was, well, can I expense it or set it up as a depreciable item? I usually would set it up as a depreciable item, take section 179 election, and then they can't go back on it. Once you've expensed it and they say, oh no, this computer for $3,000 is not expensable, deductible or expensable, then you can't take the election anymore and you're messed up. Hmm. So uh, this was, that's why everyone loved the bonus because you didn't have to elect it. No matter what you did, you were okay. Yeah, wow. Well, I mean, you did bring up, and it's our next point of the next kind of big item that's going away is claiming a net operating loss. So let's go into that a little bit. Yes, you um, you used to be able to carry it back one year was th one period of time was three years. Uh, so you have a loss in 2022. You could go back to 21, 20, 19. If you don't use up the loss in 19, you go to 20 and then 21 until it's gone. And then you could keep carrying it forward. Then they needed to produce more tax revenue. And they said, oh, and, and we had COVID with all the big losses. So mm -hmm. they would have been inundated with carry back schedules <laughs> and they couldn't keep up with the one correct so i'm doing. sure that somebody said oh my god we need to change this so and not everybody in the government is stupid right. okay. again that's the recipe for today tomorrow right. it's oh my god we're in inflation we need uh, to do help the people right so it, it wobbles back and forth um so uh so now they've done away with it all together no carry backs at all for, right for a loss. right that and so now it's carry forward, forward except uh, that it has agi limitations so if you grossed uh seven hundred and fifty thousand and you have a million dollar loss you can't take that million and offset the 750. you'd only be able to do a portion of it hmm. based on your See. agi limitations so again it's very complex Thank God for our tax softwares because I could not do a hand tax return <laughs> now. I did, you know, when I was 17, 18 years old. Sure. We'd whip them out very easily. I remember um, doing hand tax forms. You do? And, yeah. And it's sad that we're, the tax code is getting more complicated. Like you said, this is just even more difficult and there's less and less 
qualified CPAs to be able to handle this because they're retiring, because they just don't want to get into it, exactly. whatever reason. Exactly. Young people don't yeah. know it, and, and they don't have the comparison to how it was. They don't, they'll only know now. Right. Sometimes you'll get a client who hasn't filed for five years. You have to know the law for those five years. Mm. Very oh, hard. Wow. But thank God for the tax softwares. Um, some are good. They're getting very expensive, yeah. uh, even for a practitioner small like me, but with doing a 200 returns, um, their unlimited plan is like $12,000. Wow. Well, Holy it doesn't Lord. warrant it. So then there's less expensive softwares out there, but they're not good for the complex returns. Mm -hmm. and, or California, which doesn't agree with all the federal changes. Right. So you have adjustments. And if the software doesn't feed it through, you have to input that information manually, and it yeah. take the yeah, manually and it takes longer and you have to double, double, double check. It's really hard. Oh no. It's really hard. They so that's why I'm ready for retirement. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. They, they don't make it easy for us. I want to help people, but not for parents. <laughs> Well, I think you touched on it a little bit and through some of this conversation we had. Um, one of the other topics was, you know, excess business loss limits. Well, that's what we were talking about. Yeah. That, that's subject to limit. So if your loss is a million dollars, you won't get that loss in one year. You will be limited by your AGI, 270 for single taxpayers and 578 for filing joint. Any excess can be can then carried over till you use it up. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's not lost. Um, it's kind of similar to passive activities. If you don't get to deduct in the first year, it gets suspended, and in in a year you can use it. It just carries forward. Okay. But people think, oh, let's lose a lot of money, and I write it off my taxes and offset my W two, and it, it they stop that. Right. Well, and I get that, you know, I encounter people that a lot that it's like, well, let me, I'll, I'll expense this or I'll buy this, something that I don't need just to get the, the right off. And it's, that's right. the worst thing that you right. can do. I, I say you need it. <laughs> yeah. And you have to, you have to do a lot of um, planning and decision making. And Yeah. And it's, it's sad that people think tax season is January to April 15th. Tax right. season is all year round. It's Correct. not just a three month. Correct. Year. And I, with my uh, fee structure, I have an open door policy. I don't charge them for every phone call or every email. I can't, they, I don't want them to be afraid to come to me and say, oh, I'm going to ask Donna this question or do this projection and she's going to charge me $600. Yeah, so it takes no structure like lawyers. Where every, exactly. <laughs> every email, one quarter of it, right, yeah. and it's $500 for to type an email. It's, it's a, a two word email that you're going to be the answer to. Yeah, yeah, you just want confirmation. Right, yep. It costs you a lot. How about how about interest expense limitation? I know this is kind of a big one too. Yeah, um, I I don't have that because it's more for I think a ten million dollar um, gross business. Okay. The smaller person still, you know, this it's not a small person, but it's the kind of companies I deal with. Small they're small yeah, they're under a million, and I haven't had any interest issues okay okay so once you reach over 10 million then yeah yeah that it's starts sort of, to come into play yeah and do a because again they want to limit the deduction you can take right yeah okay. so so similar to that it's it just has restrictions to it okay um so we also wanted to cover a few unique tax strategies that most people don't know and are at their disposal and could drastically change their tax liabilities yeah, and, and one that I encounter on that all the time is that most CPAs don't know is the 14-day rule for your business renting your primary residence. So can you Correct. speak a little on that? Um, so we have a lot of um, Airbnbs, people renting out rooms mm -hmm. and so forth. So the 14-day rule allows you to basically do that without tax implication. You don't have to fill out a Schedule E. Um, and more, most likely the expenses you incur will offset that amount anyway. Um, it's similar to like vacation homes. We have to count the number of days you truly use it uh, for, for your own vacation or rent it out for other people. And within those days, it will see whether you can qualify to take a tax deduction or not if there's a loss. Okay. So, so like if a business owner has a Schedule C, their Schedule C corporation 
can rent out your private residence, a room or whatever, to hold their annual party or something like that. Right? Oh, yeah, and, that's, and get that expense. For the well, the party the would be an expense. Right. I don't know that they would rent out their house to do, do that. I was more. I was talking more about. Um, I have a four bedroom house. I live alone, and now and then, someone there's a there's a function in the city. Let's say uh, the Olympics. And I, I rent out my room for three days at a thousand dollars a day. That three thousand would not be taxable okay. because okay. it's under a certain number of days. Sure. It's not a true rental. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So uh, uh, keeping a good log of that kind of stuff, if you do it off and on and, and so forth, is very important. Sometimes clients come in and don't even tell us they did it. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So then I'm at a you know it's not a, a question I ask. Commonly, sure. you know, um, if they buy a second home, usually that's when I'll say, oh, you, how many days are you there and do you rent it out? Okay. That would promote the question more than your own home. Um, so I know some of the small businesses that, you know, we're currently working with, some of the prospects that we're trying to talk to have kids that, you know, come work for them. And I know one of the articles I've read that, you know, if they're a minor and they come work for you, um, the amount that you pay them up to a certain amount is, you know, you can, you know, take off of your deduct from your total revenue. And, uh, but yeah, so if you want to elaborate a little bit more on that. And avoid social security tax. Yes. Uh, It it applies to the wife as well. I don't make that a big deal. not paying in the social security tax because their wages are so low. Sure. And um, I started working for my dad when I was 14 and I did tax returns and I had all of them up until recently in a box. So how many years, that's a lot of years of tax returns. Um, But it feeds into (laughs) when we were sure social security would be there, it feeds into the pot for our quarterly benefits. Right, sure. So um, it is not something I deter people from uh, worrying about, you know, the social security aspect. Um, it just kind of depends. It's not a big, it's not a big saver. Um, I see, now that social security may go away, you know, maybe you have to think about it a little bit differently. Like why waste the funds to go in there? Um, but just be aware that it's, it exists it is a good thing. Um, but it, it's not a biggie. How about how about MERP? It's one of the things that I, I use because of my medical history and things like that. So it's the medical expense. I've been using this uh, since the 80s for uh, single member uh, corporations. Okay. Um, subchapter S, that only helps employees because there are specials for subchapter S when you're an owner. So let's talk about C corps or sole proprietors. So nor with the structure of the tax code, not many of us get to deduct medical expenses, even our normal premiums, or mm-hmm. I don't have a lot of medical issues, but you have kids and they have, so maybe you have five to 10,000 a year. Well, there's no way to deduct that on your return, but on a MERP, medical reimbursement plan for your company, you could deduct that right off the income, right off the top. So it's a deduction like anything else. Mm-hmm. You just need a formal plan typed up, which there are boilerplate templates for. Um, but it's an, you know, I have clients deduct $25,000, $30,000. Yeah. But it can only be a C-Corp or a sole proprietorship. Now for the sole proprietorship, you can't use it for yourself. You'd have to hire your spouse as an employee. And then plus all your other employees get to benefit from it. You can't exclude anybody or uh, um, only give it to high. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Discriminate. You can't discriminate. Gotcha. So no S corp or LLCs can't utilize that. Okay. LLC again. If the spouse was an employee, you could. Okay. And then cover all the other employees. Uh, A lot of people like the LLCs or sole proprietorships, so they don't have to deal with. payroll you know if it's mm-hmm. just him and his wife right. um but it, it just screwed under some of the california stuff too yeah <laughs> yeah it, it just depends on you know the if it's worth it or not right. sure. like if you have children 
if you're older and likely to have more medical bills um, not covered. Um, I had an HSA plan, which was great. Um, that's uh, above the line deduction, uh, 3,500 or 7,500 for um, a family, high deductible. So if you're healthy, you're most likely not even going to reach your deductible, but you got you have a front page deduction for the um, money you fund in the HSA. Yeah, I think one of these days we'll have to do a video on those too, because they've yeah. been growing in popularity over the years. Yeah. Well, so recent. well, because premiums are so high. It's uh -huh. a lower premium. And uh, again, this tax benefit, the money could grow tax free. So if, if you're not spending it, and all you could do is invest, you know, seven grand a year and put it in stocks. It grows when you take it out when you're older and need medical things. Right. So if you want to do your eye, you know, a, a corny, LASIKs, LASIKs or, or yeah. um, uh, prescriptions, sure. um, Medicaid, yeah, Medicaid, and yeah. yeah. So you have that pot of money that grew over the years. It's not great to have it when you're later in life because then there's not enough time. You still get that tax deduction, but not enough growth. Right. Sure. Um, and the premiums are lower. So for those three, four reasons, yeah. it's good. Now, California has gotten away from uh, some of those plans. So that's another problem. Of course. They for, the, for the individual, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they don't make it easy for no. us. I know I've said that twice now. They, they want us to give them this Cal Savers pension money to do what they, what they will, but they won't yeah. provide us with any else. Well, that's the biggest drawback to Cal Savers. You're just giving the state more of your money. Yeah, I would never give, <laughs> I would never give the state any, any money to manage for me. Right. Look at Social Security or the government. Yeah. Oh, we got, this, we, got this, we got this railway problem. Let's use these funds yeah. and then we'll put it back in 20 yeah, years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you brought up SDI. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yes, that's, that's been a, an issue with SDI has been around for a long time, but it was never a big deal because it always had a cap. What is SDI? Oh, SDI is state disability insurance that every employee has to pay into. And if you okay. get disabled, you have no other insurance plan and you get disabled, like women get pregnant or I was in an accident you can um, go to the state and they'll pay you disability benefits. Okay. okay. Being pregnant, you get paid for that? Well, sometimes, I mean, I don't know all the rules, but okay. there were times that you if would. you needed to stop work early because you had a, uh, an issue with the pregnancy, okay. not a normal one, right. um, you are disabled now from working for, I think it's a 90 day period. Uh, which applies to all disability plans, usually in 90 days. So if you're um, disabled for more than 90 days, you can get benefits from the state. Hmm. And we all pay into this fund. I don't know what, you know, what they do with it, <laughs> but they supposedly keep track of it. And if you're, uh, if, if that fund goes too low, they increase the percentages. It used to be 0.6%, then 0.9%, then 1%. It's now 1.1%. But it always had a cap on how much uh, they would tax you on. Years ago, it was 89,000, 96,000, 100,000. This uh, 2023, it's 153,000. Wow. So the max each employee pays if they make over 153,000 is $1,378. They've now taken away the cap. So if you have high earner in, uh owners of companies, 200, 400, 500,000, they now have to continue paying in that 1.1%. There is an exclusion uh, that, you can, that the owner can get out of if you're a shareholder. And uh, it's a simple form, a, a DE, did I write it down here for you? A DE, a DE 459, yeah, okay. you fill it out, you send it to the state or you could do it online. And they'll say, okay, you now do not have to uh, pay in any money from your salary to this fund. Mm -hmm. Some people have kept on because they don't have another disability policy and God forbid, they at least have something right. and their wages are not astronomical. They're, they're around the 150 range anyway. So $1,300 a year to have that protection is good. But if you have your own plan, uh, um, I'm doing away with it with clients. Hmm. Uh, 
That's, a, that's actually a good one, and not one that I was aware of. So well, it's, it's new. Okay. It's new about the cap part. The exclusion, you could have always oh, done, it done it for over the years. But again, it was so small. Let's just stay on the track with everybody else, you know, right. not be special, <laughs> and, and pay it in and help the help. This society. <laughs> it's just another one of those. The if, they, if they snuck in there yeah. that not a lot of people are probably aware of yet, but yeah. it might be after this year. So it's yeah. something to keep an eye on. So that's that yeah, is a good sure. one. And you know, there's also the employee retention credits, which we're not even going to get into because there's so much information. Like people are getting peppered with that. Well, the the IRS put out a notice that most of them are scams. You're right. It Ooh. only applies for 20 and 21 payroll. So we're in 23. If you were going to do it, you would have done it already because you needed the money. It's right. a it's a credit that's cash money that the government turns around and sends to you um, by filing a 941X. So that's instant money. There can't be anyone else who didn't jump on that bandwagon. So all this right. is just to get fees. Oh, let me do a calculation for you, see you to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. I, I have no idea why we're getting all these phone calls. It, it should be done yeah. and over. Just like ambulance chasers for you know, a lot of things, so I'm yeah. sure. But um, Well, we covered a lot of stuff here today. And if you want to get more information or get some more you know, insight on some things that we didn't cover, please reach out to us. Call us at 949-492-6900. Um, to go along with that, you know, Donna has a great website that she's put together for subscription base. Um, allows you to kind of have a CPA in your back pocket and ask a multitude of tax questions, uh, bounce ideas off of her. So please check that website out. It's prepaidtaxadvice.net. Um, I think we'll leave it there for today. We've, like I said, covered a lot. Thank you for tuning in. I hope it was educational. I hope you guys subscribe and watch some of our other business education uh, videos. Thank you again, Donna, for yeah, joining us. And we'll see you all again real soon.